So you do not believe that the universe can be explained in terms of the material only? <laughs> Almost certainly I do not. The mere materialist offers explanations which do not even deserve a place in the catalogue of errors. They are too puerile. Of visible things, materialism gives explanations one would expect from a prattling baby or from a lunatic. Of invisible things and spiritual things, it gives no explanation at all. It constructs bodies with smaller bodies, like a child playing with a set of blocks, and it gets quite out of breath by the time it gets to things of the mind. It contradicts itself by speaking of laws of matter, for a law is a decree formulated by reason, and reason is not material. Materialists are inconsequent people who prove God every time they speak in order to deny him. For at the back of every denial of God, there is the idea of God. No man can believe in truth or appreciate goodness or seek happiness without tending towards the author of these things. Yet each of these ideas leads to God. Materialism is not rational, and its only real appeal lies in the fact that it makes the universe the magnificent plaything of man's pride and gives him a free field for his passions. Is it not reasonable to suppose a purely physical cause of which we as yet know nothing? Well, I must ask you what you mean by a purely physical cause. God is a physical, though not a material being. If you intend a material cause, I say that the supposition is not reasonable. For the material cannot produce the spiritual. Thought itself is in the spiritual order, and so is the soul which produces thought. You would scorn the idea that a telegraph pole spontaneously began to produce peaches, and yet the proportion between a telegraph pole and peaches is much less than that between matter and spirit. Well, I'm a bit confused about the term of an infinite entity. Would you say the term person is capable of being used to define an infinite entity? It is capable of being applied to an infinite entity, though its significance, from our point of view, falls short of the reality as it is in God. For example, a stone is a being and a man is a being. The word being is equally true of each, though one who knew only stones would not know of its full implication in man. So too, man is personal and God is personal. Person is true of each. But we, who have experimental knowledge only of human persons, do not know its full implication in God. Yet, though there is not absolute identity of concept, there is a true analogy of concept. And in revealing that he is personal, God has conveyed the real truth to us in a way adapted to our lesser capacity. When you call God Father, do you not imply that there is sex in God and that he is masculine? No. The word father is used of God not to imply that he is of the masculine gender, a quality proper to material bodies, but merely to denote our production by God. And this, not as by some blind mechanical force, but by an intelligent and loving principle of being. The word father is the nearest human expression suitable for the proportionate truth to be declared. As directly drawn from human beings, of course, the word implies procreation by mutual cooperation between the sexes, and that supposes masculine and feminine. But when applied to God, abstraction is made from the mode or process of production, and the sense is restricted to the fact of our production by God and to the parental dispositions of God towards us. We thus express in our human way a characteristic which is really in God, though not precisely as it is in man. God is truly a father to us. Face the dilemma. God could either prevent evils or not. If he can but will not, he's not good. If he cannot, he is not all-powerful. That dilemma is invalid. If a dilemma is to be valid, the disjunction must be complete, exhausting all possibilities. There must be no room for the reply, datur tertium. There is a third possibility. Your dilemma fails if evil and pain and suffering be useful. What if the evils we see in this world are the necessary condition of a higher good? And what if, still more, they be indispensable to the progress of man and the realization of his destiny, if someday they are to be compensated by the eternity of happiness? In any case, for a dilemma to be valid, the uh, inference from each alternative in itself must be certain and indisputable. Neither of your alternatives is even reasonable. So do you say that even God cannot prevent these evils? 
Absolutely speaking, God could annihilate the whole of creation. And then, of course, there would be no problem of evils in the universe. But granted that God wants this type of world, then pain and suffering are a necessary condition. And it was certainly better to permit them than not to create a universe in which it was possible for them to occur. As it is, your very terms involve a contradiction. In practice, the assertion that if God cannot remove all pain, he is not all-powerful means where physical pain is concerned that if God cannot have sensitive beings, then without their being sensitive, he is not all-powerful. For granted the power of sensation, our sensations will be pleasant and unpleasant even with the variations of the weather. Where moral evil is concerned, your assertion means if God cannot have free and morally responsible beings who are not really free and morally responsible, he is not all-powerful. For granted freedom of will, moral evil is a necessary possibility. Can you give me evidence that God exists? I've never had any such evidence, for I don't accept the Bible. What do you mean by evidence? Some people think that evidence must be seen and touched as an animal sees a patch of grass and eats it. But men are not mere animals. They have reason and can appreciate intellectual evidence. For example, the evidence of beauty in music or in painting is perceived by man's mind, not by his senses. An animal could hear the same sounds or see the same colors without being impressed by their harmony and proportion. Apart from the Bible altogether, reason can detect sufficient evidence to guarantee the existence of God. Well, okay, I guess you know what my next question is going to be then. What is this evidence for God's existence apart from the Bible? Well, there are many indications, the chief of which I shall give you very briefly. The first is from causality. The universe, limited in all its details, could not be its own cause. It could no more come together with all its regulating laws than the San Francisco Harbor Bridge could just happen, or a clock could assemble itself and keep perfect time without a clockmaker. On the same principle, if there were no God, there would be no you to dispute his existence. A second indication is drawn from the universal reasoning, or, if you wish, intuition of men. The universal judgment of mankind can no more be wrong on this vital point than the intuition of an infant that food must be conveyed to the mouth. The stamp of God's handiwork is so clearly impressed upon creation, and above all upon man, that all nations instinctively believe that there is a God. The truth is in possession. Men do not have to persuade themselves that there is a God. They have to try to persuade themselves that there is not. And no one yet who has attained to such a temporary persuasion has been able to find a valid reason for it. Men do not grow into the idea of a God. They endeavor to grow out of it. The sense of moral obligation confirms these reasons. In every man there is a sense of right and wrong. A man knows interiorly when he is doing wrong. Something rebukes his conduct. He knows that he is going against an inward voice. It is the voice of conscience dictating to us a law we did not make and which no man could have made, for this voice protests whether other men know our conduct or not. The voice is often quite against what we wish to do, warning us beforehand, condemning us after its violation. The law dictated by this voice of conscience supposes a lawgiver who has written this law in our hearts. And as God alone could do this, it is certain that he exists. And finally, justice demands that there be a God. The very sense of justice among men resulting in law courts supposes a just God. We did not give ourselves our sense of justice. It comes from whoever made us, and no one can give what he does not possess himself. Yet justice cannot always be done by men in this world. Here the good often suffer and the wicked prosper. And even though human justice does not always succeed in balancing the scales, they will be balanced someday by a just God, who most certainly must exist. What do you mean by the term of God? What do I mean? I'm talking about God as being a spiritual, substantial, personal being, infinite in intelligence, in will, and in all perfection. Absolutely simple or lacking composition, immutable happy in himself and by himself, and infinitely superior to all that is or can be conceived apart from himself. He is incomprehensible in his infinite perfection by all lesser intelligences, although knowable as to the fact of his existence as living creator and lord of heaven and earth, 
almighty, eternal, immense, and distinct from all that he has created. That is what I mean by God. How do you know that God is eternal, or always was, is, and will be? Because if God ever had a beginning, then before he began, there was nothing. Now nothing, with nothing to work upon, and no faculties with which to work, could never turn its non-existent self into something. But there is obviously something, and there can never have been a time when there was nothing. God, at least, must always have existed. And if no one is responsible for his beginning, there is no one who could possibly bring his existence to an end. He always will be. God rightly declared himself the eternally existent being when he said to Moses, I am who I am. The philosopher Spinoza said that if God created the world for an object, he desires something he lacks, which denies his infinite perfection. Spinoza's objection is not valid. He fails to distinguish between God's essential constitution, which is necessary to his being, and his free operations resulting in created things. If God's creating operations were necessary, Spinoza would be right. But God did not create in order to acquire perfection necessary to himself. He created to bestow perfections upon others. If I am laboring to acquire, I lack something I want. If I give to others, that proves not my lack but my superabundance.